Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to today's presentation. Um, we're going to talk about some very important topics within the autism community today that have to do with applied behavior analysis and the autism spectrum. Um, we're going to talk about sexual behavior. Um, this presentation is entitled, Can I Touch You? Sexual Behavior and Autism by me, Travis Breeding. Um, so let's get started. On today's agenda, uh, there, first of all, I'd like to introduce the idea that there are no conflicts of interest in this presentation that I'm aware of. I'm not um, contracted with anybody or, um, you know, I don't have a professional affiliation or anything like that. So, um, but we are going to talk about sex. Um, this is not the birds and bees of sexuality. So this is a pretty, I would call this an intermediate talk on sexual behavior. I'm developing an advanced talk on sexual behavior as we speak, but this is my intermediate talk on sexual behavior. Um, and, um, yeah, so this is going to be everything but the birds and bees. So be prepared. We are going to talk about sex. We're not going to talk about physically having sex, but we're going to talk about the social and emotional components of having sex. Um, if I offend anyone, I'm sorry. Don't blame the host of this presentation. You can blame me and talk to me about it. Um, that's very important. So the introduction, we're going to go, I'm going to go through the agenda here real quick for you today before we get started. Um, and we might get all the way through this presentation today and we might not. But that's okay because I'll come back and we'll do another presentation and continue it at a later date. Um, so we're going to talk about who I am. I'm going to share my story, tell you how I fell in love with ABA. Um, we're going to talk about Peter Gerhardt because Peter Gerhardt is one of the most influential people in the field of ABA for me. He is how I fell in love with ABA by watching one of his presentations at the Behavior Analysis Center for Autism in Fishers, Indiana. Um, I was able to get in touch with him because I met the Sunbergs, Carl and Devin who had the center there. And then I met Ben Seifert, my friend Ben Seifert, who uh, helped me with BC. He was my BCBA for a while, working with me kind of pro bono. I wasn't paying him. So that was very nice of the Sunbergs and Ben to do. Um, and then I also, um, you know, I met Peter at a presentation because uh, the Behavior Analysis Center for Autism contracted out with professionals like Pat McGeevy and Peter Gerhardt um, and, you know, lots of people to um, really develop their um, skill set for their BCBAs and their RBTs so they could be better prepared to help kids with autism. So uh, that's really exciting. Um, and then I met Peter at a presentation that he did in Fishers. So we're going to talk about that presentation a little bit and how that changed my life and got me hooked on ABA. Um, then we're going to go into the, how the autistic brain is an all or nothing thinker, very black and white. Um, the gray areas do not exist for me. Um, mindfulness helps me be present in the current moment and navigate gray concepts. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot about the, th you'll notice that the overall theme to this presentation is talking about something that Peter Gerhardt introduced me to in the very first presentation that I ever saw him present. We're gonna talk a lot about going from step one to step 787. Hi, I'm Travis. Can I touch your breast? Okay, that's the example Peter Gerhardt used. And that's the example I learned from and how I learned how to interact with women in dating relationships. Um, so in importance, it's, we're also going to talk about then the importance of learning steps two through 786. I believe it is very important to have all the steps to be able to chain all those steps so that you can actually build a relationship and have a really healthy, meaningful relationship with someone. So that's very important. Um, but we will talk about mindfulness and ABA, like I mentioned. Um, it's important soft skill for BCBAs and the RBTs. It makes my brain more flexible to gray thinking. It relieves some anxiety and it helps me generalize and apply in all social contexts and different settings. Well, context is king. We're going to look at technical skills and that's just one part of the battle. And then we're going to look at examples of contextual errors I've made and why context is king. I've got a little story I'm going to tell you about how I walked up to a girl in a bar and said, hey, bitch, what's up? Because I saw a friend of mine do that, and I thought it would work for me. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and obviously, that didn't work out very well for me. Um, but we're gonna, then I'm going to talk about how I started a higher level skill, and then backward chain down to where I'm at, and then I forward chain back to get back up to the top. So we're going to talk about the chaining process and how I generalize down and apply, generalize and apply down, and then generalize and apply back up to learn that new skill. So that's very important. Um, so yes, you must learn a technical skill, but then you must learn how to generalize and apply that skill in all different social contexts. We're going to talk about extinction. Um, this is why ABA gets a bad reputation with autistic adults sometimes. Um, why is stimming important to me? 
We're going to talk about teaching products and social skills to decrease inappropriate stemming behaviors. Um, never try to fully eliminate a stem. It will come back as something different. Even times, even stems need to generalize and apply in all contexts. Visible versus un invisible. We can see and observe current behavior, but we don't see skills we are trying to shape with topography. We don't see MO or motivation. Observing the invisible. Nonverbal communication is important, and operationally defining the visible and invisible is a step that we're going to talk about for BCBAs and RBTs as we get into this presentation. From uncomfortable to comfortable. Um, so learning to live in the uncomfortable is important. Um, must be comfortable and with being uncomfortable. That's important because if you're going to learn, you have to be comfortable. And there, we're not. there's going to be times when we're not comfortable. So we're going to have to learn how to live in the moment and be uncomfortable so that we can be present and mindful and have our mind connected to our body so that we can learn. I learn better when I'm comfortable in my environment. That makes sense. Uh, being comfortable reduces anxiety. And generalization and application from uncomfortable to comfortable and from comfortable to uncomfortable is important. And I'll explain more about that later in the presentation. We'll talk a little bit about dual relationships for BCBAs and RBTs. Um, it's walking a thin line. So it's hard to help a client without connecting with us. Um, family outings are perfect natural environment teaching opportunities. And good personal relationships fuel great therapy. Current, we're going to talk about the current adult services landscape. Um, the primary source of care is a DSP for me, not a BCBA. Um, generalization and application from BCBA to, B to DSP. We're going to talk about how I've worked with a 19-year-old DSP for years and also working with a 30-year-old BSP or 30-year-old behavior analyst, BCBA, with a master's degree in applied behavior analysis and what it's like to generalize back and forth between working with the 19-year-old DSP up to working with the 30-year-old BCBA. <clears throat> Um, your client will generalize up or down to the skill set being taught. I was higher functioning, but because lower function, but became lower functioning to work with a 19 year old DSP. Um, basically the 19 year old DSP wanted to teach me skills that were below where I was at. Um, so I had to generalize down and apply to become lower functioning so that I could work with my DSP. Um, when working with my BCBA, I started becoming higher functioning because I was able to generalize and apply up and practice going on a higher functioning level and work on higher level social skills. And I would learn new social skills. Um, it's important for me, I want to create interdis interdisciplinary teams in ABA. So I want like your ABA, your speech, your OT, your psychiatry, um, your psychology, all of it to be together under one roof because I think that's very important because context is king and we want everybody to be operating off of the same operational definition and have accurate descriptions of that operational definition. Then we're going to talk about motivation. It's a four-term contingency, guys. So MO equals motivation. Um, motivation matters. Um, and the four-term contingency is MO, ABC. So for those of you that aren't behavior analysts um, or in the field of ABA, we have motivation, we have antecedent, we have behavior, and we have consequence. And that is how we navigate social behaviors. Um, it is a difference between good and bad ABA. Um, this is why ABA gets a bad rep with autistic adults because we don't often care about, sometimes in the past, ABA is getting better about this, but in the past, applied behavior analysis, people would assume that you didn't care about motivation because it wasn't talked about. In fact, in the 40-hour RBT training that I just took, just for fun, you know, it, motivation is a very small part of that training. And so a lot of people only think of a three-term contingency, ABC, a lot of people don't talk about the MO and the four-term contingency. And that's probably the most important part of the contingency. We need to care and understand reasons for behavior. If we don't understand, if I can tell you right now, as an autistic person, if you don't understand the reason for my behavior, you have little to no chance of actually helping me with my social behavior. And then you're going to, we're talking, let's talk about takeaways from today's presentation that you can expect to have when we leave here. So when done correctly, ABA is the most person-centered approach to helping me with autism I've ever experienced. When done incorrectly, it is the worst approach to helping me. I don't think bad ABA exists, guys. So a lot of people talk about good ABA and bad ABA, but I think ABA is only good. Like, ABA can't be bad if done properly. So, like, if done in the context of how it's supposed to be delivered, ABA is good, and there is no such thing as bad ABA because bad ABA is not true ABA. Um, it's hard to help... 
how, we're going to learn how to help teens and adults. So you're going to take away that from today's presentation. And then what you should take away from today is that you have the power to make a difference in someone's life. Let's get started. Who am I? I'm a 37-year-old author, consultant, speaker in the field of autism. I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome at age 22. I am from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was born and raised in Huntington, Indiana, just outside of Fort Wayne. And I love sports, music, friendships, family, and relationships. My story. Uh, I decided at the age of 22 that for some reason I wanted a girlfriend. Um, and I sought counseling to understand why girls were calling me creepy. Um, girls would often use the word creepy or creepy nice with me. We'll talk about that later. Um, counselor had a suspicion it was deeper than girls not liking me. Um, I desired healthy relationships. That's something I have always desired, but I've not known how to get to them. Um, and I have experience with unhealthy relationships, i.e. paying for friendship. I was mainstreamed all the way through school, so that's important to know as we go through this presentation. I didn't get ABA as a child. My interest in ABA came as an adult, and I've studied it as a special interest, which is how I know a little bit about applied behavior analysis. Um, so mainstreamed all the way through school. Uh, my story continues here. Uh, elementary school was simple for me. Girls nurtured me in elementary school. Um, I had one best friend named Eric. Eric moved away in fifth grade. I never had another best friend until age 26. I joined band and played trombone as a coping mechanism for autism. Things changed in middle school. I went from one teacher all day long to having eight different teachers. This meant that I had eight different teaching styles to learn from. Um, the passing periods were torture for me. I absolutely hated passing periods, guys. Um, kids would congregate. Kids use passing periods as social hour. And I was very pinpointed to the point I wanted to go to my locker, get my books, and then get straight to class. Um, I didn't want to mess around with having small talk or socializing in the hallway all day long because I just wanted to get to class so I could focus on my next task. Um, the other kids wanted to socialize and they'd congregate in front of my locker. And like I wouldn't necessarily... Sometimes I'd go to class without the books I needed, and often at night I would go home without my coat because I didn't want to fight through the crowd to get to my locker. Um, so there was a lot of bullying in middle school and high school. Um, people would do things like teabag me in high school because I didn't have a girlfriend or didn't know how to, um, didn't know how to like, um, you know, I, I didn't have sex, um, and they would teabag me and hit me and punch me and make fun of me, and people would like laugh at me and make fun of me. Um, all of the above. So I was pretty bullied in middle school and high school. Um, and then, I, like I said, I left school without a coat a lot. Um, lunches in the cafeteria were kind of torturous for me because they were really loud. So a lot of the kids talked a lot and um, like yelled and screamed. And like it was just really loud and sensory overwhelming in the cafeteria. Um, and I was also really stressed out about the fact that I was trying to find someone to sit with me or find someone to let me sit with them. And that was really stressful for me because I worried about it and was very anxious about it a lot. So um, recess was another stressful area because I wanted to play, I wanted to socialize. Middle school recess, an elementary school recess was kind of simple. You kind of played around on the playground and did swing on the swing sets or um, played some basketball or just played cowboys and Indians or whatever you wanted to do. Um, and there was kind of a script for how to do that. Um, I followed Eric's lead. He was my friend in elementary school. Um, and then in middle school, recess kind of changed to more of a gossiping time, more of a social hour. Um, and that was uh, when I started to really notice my social indifferences and notice how different I was and how challenging social life was going to be for me. Um, I escape into imagination to create a make-believe world through music. So I, like I said, I played the trombone. Um, and I use that as a coping mechanism. So whenever I feel overwhelmed, I just I would imagine playing trombone for the symphony orchestra or being a conductor of a symphony orchestra and just I would get into the music and escape into imagination through my music. So that's very important. Um, lying versus the make-believe world. So a lot of times people with autism, um, it's known that people with autism don't like to lie. Um, and... Um, that's very really important, and it's true. Like, we don't even like to tell white lies, but when someone is caught up in escaping into their imagination, they create this make-believe world. It can be like having hallucinations, and it can actually get confused for schizophrenia, which is might, might be a little bit of what's happened to me. Um, 
but um, when you escape into that imagination, you create these make believe world, the things around you. Um, it's easy to tell people about your make believe world because you're trying to cope and living in the make believe. You're living within the context of that make believe world, and so that creates some challenges because then you think it's real and you start telling people about it and people don't believe you or people think you're crazy or all of the above. So it's very important that we understand. I've got a couple of books out that I've written called escaping into imagination, um, creating a make-believe world as a coping mechanism. Um, that are very important books. And so we'll talk more about that later on in the presentation a little bit. Um, but I also get sensory overloaded by emotions. So what happens for me is I tend to pick up on other people's emotions pretty strongly guys. Um, so, like I had a best friend, my best friend, her father passed away about 10 years, about six years ago. And I was distraught. I thought it was the end of the world. And she was kind of distraught, but she wasn't as distraught as I was. And so I was overgeneralizing her emotions. Like I was picking up on her emotions and I thought she was um, going to be the most sad person in the world. And so I started wanting to fix it. I wanted to make it better. I wanted to, um, you know, I, I tried to um, send her flowers every single day for like two weeks. I tried to order meals for her at a restaurant and have them delivered to her house. Here I was, I was trying to fix her problem and her situation and make her feel better, but she wasn't as distraught as I was or as worried about it as I was, and I was overreacting. So what happens when I have this huge, intense emotional response to someone is my social skills and responding to that person can be very overwhelming to them um, and out of context. So like I should have been like, hey, how's it going? I hope you're okay. Or I'm sorry about your loss. And that's it. I should have been done with it. Um, but I was so intent on overreacting um, or letting her know that I cared about her that I overreacted and overgeneralized her her emotions and made her emotions my, my emotion. I made my emotions her emotions. And that's very important that we don't do that. Um, so like being sensory overloaded by somebody else's emotions can affect your social behavior and affect your social skills. Um, so that's very important to understand. Girls change in middle school. Um, I changed in middle school as well. Um, but um, puberty changes everyone. Um, your social skills, your social repertoire changes. It's not just physical changes, but it's social and emotional changes with puberty. That's very important to understand. Um, and I joined everything band related to escape bullying. Girls... Men- Girls nurture guys with autism until puberty. I've learned, I learned that um, when you're a little different in elementary school, girls think it's cute and they want to like nurture you. They think you're adorable and they want to help you along. Um, however, when you hit middle school, these same girls go through puberty and the guy goes through puberty. All of a sudden, I think the girls are cute. I think the girls are pretty. Um, they think that I li- like them and want to date them. So now they're not going to be nice to me and nurture me because they think I might take it the wrong way. Um, so yeah, then guys with autism become a threat because we might want to date them. Um, girls' social behavior toward me changed when we went through puberty in middle school. I went from not creepy, I wasn't creepy to girls in elementary school, but as soon as I liked them and wanted to date them, I was creepy. Uh, generalizing social skills from pre-puberty to puberty. So like basically is your social skills are the same, right? Like you're still using the same social skills to talk to someone, but you're generalizing and applying them differently in different contexts. Because now you went through puberty and you're trying to learn how to um, interact with the girls and show them you're, you're romantically interested in them now instead of just being friends with them. And that changes the context of how you socialize with them. Um, I watched other guys succeed while I failed and that was really hard on me. Um, I wanted to be like other guys. Let's talk about high school. Um, joining, I joined marching band and other bands in high school. I was in pep band, marching band, show choir, backup band, all, jazz band, all the above. Uh, I was further escaping into the imagination, so I was trying to escape the bullying. Um, for, I tried to run away from it. I tried to get away through my music and get into my trombone. In fact, there was a story I got to tell you. Um, I was bullied by another kid who played trombone because I was the first chair. I practiced so much. It was my special interest. I was always first chair. And this kid was sitting right behind me in second chair. And he got upset because he couldn't beat me in challenge. And he told me that, um, well, you practice your trombone so much, you're going to end up marrying your trombone. Um, And at the time, it didn't really mean anything to me. But later, as I was going through this hard time with dating and relationships and sexuality and sexual behavior, it hurt me because he was right. Like, I spent so much time practicing trombone, not enough time in socializing that... 
I was going to end up marrying my trombone and not marrying a woman. Um, and that really affected me and really made me think down, frown upon myself and um, things like that. So, um, but then we're going to talk about teabagging it a little bit. So like I was in marching band and these guys would come up to you and they knew, they all knew that I struggled with talking to girls, but really wanted a girlfriend. Um, and they'd come up to me and they would talk to me and they would, they basically make fun of me. And then they would like, um, basically long story short, they would say, because I wasn't feeling a breast that they had to kick me in the balls and teabag me. I think they called it teabagging, but they would kick me in the balls and say, I wasn't a real man. And that obviously hurt a little bit, both physically and emotionally. Um, the gap started growing between myself and my peers. So I noticed that the social skills of my peers were really taking off and they were going to higher levels while I was still stuck down here at these lower levels. Um, so that's really important to understand. Um, and then I'm staying in, I stayed in friendships where I was bullied and taken advantage of because I was desperate for that companionship and those friendships. And that was unhealthy of me to do. Um, being, I was a goody two shoes, so like I didn't want to get my in elementary school, middle school, I didn't want to get in trouble. High school, I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, I actually tried to avoid it at all costs because I thought it was like a horrible thing to get your name written on the board of someone who was getting in trouble. Um, so I tried to be the goody two shoe, and that got me made fun of as well. Um, but I was asked, and I thought I should do exactly what I was told to do, um, and I did, and it got me made fun of and bullied and all of the above, and. Looking back, there were times when I thought where I should have maybe acted out or misbehaved to be cool or to be accepted socially by my peers. Um, so I didn't want to get my name on the board, like I mentioned. Um, I got my first job when I turned 16. I started working at Ponderosa Steakhouse in Huntington, Indiana. Um, I, was eight, I was 16, like I said. I worked with a lot of cute girls. Um, girls take advantage of me because they knew I liked them. Um, like a girl would pretend to be sick or pretend to not want to do her work because she knew I would do it for her or they'd go out and take like a smoke break and let me do my job and her job because they knew I would because I liked them. Um, so they would take advantage of the situation. Um, I send girls flowers on Valentine's Day at work. I often sent girls flowers at work, but on Valentine's Day, I got this idea because I liked this one particular girl that I was working with and I didn't want her to know that I liked her. So, cause I was afraid of her. Um, and so I got this brilliant idea that I would, uh, send all the girls that worked on Valentine's day flower, dozen roses. So I ended up sending like 12 dozen roses to the restaurant for every single woman that was working that day. And, um, I, I obviously I spent a lot of money, but like I, I sent them and I, I thought that I was hiding who I liked, but everyone knew who I liked cause I could tell cause of the way I acted around her non-verbally and um, stuff like that. So, um, but needless to say, some of the girls that I sent the flowers to were married or had boyfriends that got really upset that I sent them flowers. And so like they started, the boyfriends and husbands started calling into Ponderosa to the workplace and basically like complaining because I did that. So I got into some trouble at work. Thankfully I didn't lose my job because people knew I had something issues going on and was a little bit different. Um, but still it was kind of a traumatizing experience for me because I... Yeah, I just didn't know how to um, process my feelings for someone without doing inappropriate sexual advances or sexual behaviors. So that's very important. Um, I form crushes, obviously. You can tell from my last story, but I do have crushes on people. Um, people with autism do crush, and they crush very hard. Um, and sometimes those crushes turn into special interest. Um, you can have a special interest in a person, and that's very important to understand as well because... Um, that special interest can lead to some intense social behaviors that could lead to stalking and a girl feeling stalked or makes people think that you're creepy because you have a special interest in them. Um, so my way of telling a girl that I liked her was to always send her a dozen roses. I didn't come out verbally and tell her I liked her and I didn't know how to non-verbally show her I liked her other than send her flowers. So if I liked someone, I'd be like, if I had one conversation with you, I'd meet you at the front desk of the doctor's office and you're the receptionist and I liked you, I would say hi to you, and then I would just go home, and I'd find the nearest flower shop, and I would call and have a dozen roses delivered to the receptionist at the front desk. Um, that's how I would tell a girl that I liked her. So that's caused me to get into some trouble at work in a couple occasions. So I uh, graduated high school. I graduated high school on June 5th, 2004. 
I got into the IU School of Music because I was really good at trombone because it was my special interest and I practiced like 30, no, five hours a day. Um, I had good grades in elementary school, worse grades in middle school, and even worse, even worser grades in high school, if that's a word. Um, but um, yeah, so middle school became hard because I started changing classes. Um, the social environment changed. Um, and I started desiring my MO change from wanting to succeed academically to wanting to succeed socially. Um, and then in high school, it just generalized and changed even more. My MO was more about social communication and social relationships than it was about academics. Um, that's very important to note. Um, I was lucky to get into IU simply because I didn't have the grades. Typically, I wouldn't have gotten into IU, so I had to have an academic sponsor, basically like a tutor, and my trombone professor had to like tutor me and basically um, helped me get through, had to sponsor me in order for me to be accepted into the IU School of Music and University. So I was sponsored by my trombone professor. Now let's talk about college here. Um, college is very important. Um, I love the college atmosphere. I love the environment. I just didn't understand it. So um, I was still undiagnosed. There were 60,000 students at IU um, it was big, right? So it was huge. Um, I had bedwetting problems. So I've actually always had, up until the age of about 26, I went to bed. Um, and so I didn't stay on campus in a dorm because of that reason. Um, so I got my own apartment. The college made an exception for me. Um, typically, freshmen are required to live on campus. Um, but I got an apartment off campus um, and lived off campus. And that contributed to some social challenges for me at IU. Um, a lot of social anxiety. I was overwhelming. I tried to escape a couple times. I came home the first weekend I was there, um, and I just knew that it wasn't going to work because it was too big. Um, and I ended up lasting about two weeks at IU. Um, and I lasted two weeks at IU before I quit and came home. I got my job back at Ponderosa, and I enrolled in college courses at Indiana Wesleyan University, where I knew the band director pretty well. Um... So that's really important. I knew someone there, and that was really helpful. Um, and then I took music classes only, so I wasn't overwhelmed. So I didn't take any that first semester. I, I was too late because I transferred in, but they allowed me to do music classes and not academic classes. And that was helpful because I could just focus on my music and my socializing, and I didn't have to worry about academics. Um, guys, let's face it. I was never in college to study academics. I was in college to learn how to socialize. Um, that's being raw honesty with you. Um, I was just doing it for fun to make friends. I had no intentions on focusing on academics, like I said, and I was only interested in social skills. <clears throat> the gap continues to grow. Um, the gap between my peers and, and my, my peers and myself grows sexually. That's a misprint there. So the gap between my peers and I grows sep sexually. Um, I'm starting to like woman. I was starting to like woman as I got more and more into college. Um, women develop sexually. So now women are obviously, now this happened in high school, but like I'm a little late here. Um, but women actually started developing breasts and like developing their bodies. And now they were more attractive and I wanted to be with them and I wanted to do things with them. Um, so women start developing, um, sexual, social thinking and sexual, social behavior comes into play. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit here, but, um, there's different social context, um, but we're going to talk about, before we move on, let's talk about sexual and social behavior and sexual and social thinking, because these are important topics. And, um, you know, sexual behavior um, is social behavior. Behavior analysts will tell you that. Dr. Peter Gerhardt taught me that. Um, sexual behavior is social behavior. And then Michelle Garcia Winner actually talks about social thinking. Um, she's the god, not the god, but the... Um, Guru of social thinking. That's what I'm looking for. Guru. Michelle Garcia Winner is the guru of social thinking. And so, but my opinion is if you're going to say sexual behavior is social behavior, then there must be a concept called social sexual thinking. Because if we have social thinking, there must be sexual thinking. And to me, all sexual thinking is, is flirting and knowing how to flirt. Um, so that's what sexual thinking is. Um, now we're going to go back and talk about different social contexts. Um, going back and forth between IWU and IPFW. So my story is that I would go, I would take a semester at Indiana Wesleyan University, make people, people thought I was weird. So I would leave and go to a different university. I went to IPFW 
And then people thought I was weird there. So I went back to Indiana Wesleyan University and I kept going back and forth for about six semesters um, because I was trying to find my home. I was trying to find my place where I fit in. And I often would think that if I just went to a different environment, things would be better socially for me. And that never happened, unfortunately. So I was generalizing and applying my skills between private school and public school because IWU, Indiana Wesleyan University, is a private school and um, IPFW is a public school. So the private school is kind of like an extension of high, extinction, extension of high school. Um, and so public school is kind of like a professional work-life development, uh, work-life place. So there's not really any supervision at a public school where you can get in trouble. At a private school, you can get yourself into trouble. And because of my sexual behavior, as we'll talk about in the coming slides, I actually did get into quite a bit of trouble at my, at my um, private school in Indiana Wesleyan University. So I had to generalize and apply back and forth between going from public to private school and understanding what the behavior expectations were from private school to public school. Getting into trouble at Indiana Wesleyan University. I was eventually expelled from Indiana Wesleyan University for being sexually inappropriate. I would get a woman's AIM instant messenger screen name. Um, and what I mean by that is back in the day, early 2000s, AOL, AIM instant messenger was the thing. AOL was the internet for when the internet first came out. Um, but AIM instant messenger was the thing. And girls would take their screen name when Facebook came out and they'd post their screen name and their about me information on Facebook. And at the time when Facebook first started, there wasn't a Facebook messenger. wasn't it was it wasn't what it is today. And so um, you couldn't message people on Facebook really, um, other than sending like an email. Um, and so if you wanted to like chat with someone, you had to get their AIM instant messenger or MSN messenger or whatever the above, whatever whatever one you chose. Um, and so when girls posted that on their profile, I got their AIM instant messenger screen name. So I messaged them on AIM. And I did the same thing with their cell phone numbers because some girls would put their cell phone numbers on Facebook and I would just send them a text from my phone um, and try and get to know them that way. And they'd be like, well, who are you? Obviously, when I contacted them on AIM or by cell phone, they would be like, well, who are you, man? Um, and I'd be like, I'm Travis. And they'd be like, well, how'd you get my number? And I'd be like, I'd basically be like, um, you know, you gave it to me um, because they posted it on Facebook. And to me, that was them giving it to me and giving me permission to text them and call them. Um, to the girl, to the woman, that was not her giving somebody she didn't know permission to text her or call her. So my brain, my mind blindness, blindness here is like, well, why would you put your information on Facebook if you don't want someone you're friends with on Facebook to contact you? Um, and I didn't understand that. And that was really difficult for me to, um, to figure out. From diagnosis to being expelled. Women complain about my behavior at IWU. Their parents called the school to complain about me too and even threatened to make, stop making donations to the university if I wasn't expelled. Private school versus public school, we talked a little bit about expectations there. Um, ex private school is the expansion of high school. Um, being, I was asked to take a medical withdrawal, basically. Um, so like, because I found out that I had Asperger's at about the same time as I was getting expelled, the university was kind enough to let me take a medical withdrawal instead of just expelling me. And so I received that diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome on the same day that I was expelled. But the diagnosis wasn't enough. Um, I'd caused too much trouble, and I was asked to leave Indiana Wesleyan University. So I did. October 30th, 2007 is the day that changed my life forever. Um, this day changed my life. I was diagnosed by Dr. Jay Favre in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I told Indiana Wesleyan about my diagnosis, and that's when they allowed me to take that medical withdrawal. Um, I left school and was told I wasn't allowed back on campus and people were scared of me because I was my sexual, because of my sexual behavior. So basically we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but like because of inappropriate sexual behavior, not understanding sexuality and sexual behavior, I was labeled as a sexual predator. Um, and that was very damaging to me. It created a lot of trauma, and PTSD for me. Um, it really hurt my feelings. Now I'm off to IPFW in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, I've been there before, but I was going back to IPFW because I was kicked out of Indiana Wesleyan. Um, so I went back to public school at IPFW. I was only focused on curing myself of autism at the time because I had just been diagnosed. And when first diagnosed, 
I didn't know what autism was really. I had heard of it. And I definitely didn't know what Asperger's syndrome was. So I was focused on curing my Asperger's syndrome, which is impossible. Um, and I don't want to do that anymore, even though the DSM, current DSM cured me of Asperger's. Um, we know that's not true. Um, I was focused on social behavior, not academics. And I was determined to get a girlfriend. I was unsuccessful. I paid girls my financial, gave girls my financial aid money, basically, for a lot of things. Um, you know how you get those Stafford loans, you get them, you get your Pell Grant, you get all that money to pay for an apartment or to pay for schooling. And I was using it to pay for uh, girls to be friends with me, girls to be sexual with me, and so on. So I paid to sit next to girls in class. It was nothing for a girl to tell me because of my weird behavior and how socially inappropriate I was. It was nothing for a girl to tell me that if you give me 50 bucks, I'll sit next to you in class and talk to you. The club and bar scene was very important. Um, now that I was 22, people in college went to the bar and club. So I noticed that people my age were starting to go out on weekends and go out to the bar and go out to the club. Um, I wanted to dance with a woman, and I thought people, I heard people talking about dancing at the club. So I wanted to go to the club so I could dance with a woman. Um, I tried going to the club. It was sensory overwhelming for me because there was lots of loud music, lots of lighting issues, things like that. But I loved it because women were there. Um, and asking, I asked women to dance. Um, so will you dance with me? Um, and I received the response quite a bit of, <clears throat> if you buy me a drink, I'll dance with you. So I got that response quite a bit. Some women shaped a new social behavior. Now, it's important to know that I'm saying some women because not all women will take advantage of someone with Asperger's syndrome for money. There are a lot of good women out there. Um, so when women offered to dance with me, if I bought them a drink, it taught me a new behavior, a new concept. Um, it gave, if you give me something, I'll give you something in return. The exchange, this escalated all the way up to, if you buy me breast implants, you can see or feel them. Um, I've had a lot of girls tell me if I buy them implants, I can play with them. Um, luckily I've never actually bought implants before. They're a lot of money. Um, this became a learned behavior because paying for love and sex was a learned behavior now. Because of what girls had conditioned me, girls and socially conditioned me to believe that I had to pay for love and sex. Now we're going to talk about pickup artists. Um, when we don't support autistic individuals with sexuality, they will seek help as uh, on their own, and bad things can happen. This is important, guys. So in two thousand seven, back in two thousand seven, I googled the phrase "How do I get a girlfriend?" I found pickup artists. Pickup artists are appealing to the autistic population, especially Asperger's syndrome. PUA is rule governed behavior, and people on the spectrum like me love written rules. Rule governed behavior, I love it. I'm a sucker for it. So, women are people, not objects. Um, I was a global Aspie. PUA pickup artists treat women as objects and not people. Learning to neg my object. So, picky, like for example, um, one of the concepts that pickup artists teach you is to neg someone. Um, they really want you to neg someone and um, work on, you know, put her down basically to get her to like you. Something about that creates attraction, I guess, um, in a woman because um, they're so used to getting compliments that if you neg them, it makes them wonder why you're doing it and they want to prove themselves to you supposedly. Um, I think that's all a bunch of garbage to tell you the truth. Um, but so they would tell me to um, basically to neg the woman and pick on her nose and say, like, I love the way your nose wiggles when you laugh. Um, so I tried that. Um, and then I tried to apply that to other things. And it didn't work for me because I was very black and white, right? So what happened to me, to me, if you're going to neg someone, that means do the opposite of give them a compliment. So I was going to basically shame, the, shame her um, instead of compliment her. Um, so if I was going to go up to a girl and say, I think you're really pretty, I like you, I was going to go up then... To me, nagging meant going up to a girl and saying, hey, I'm Travis, I think you're really ugly, I don't like you. Um, and I thought that was part of the game, um, like flirting game. Um, and I, I just totally, again, I was learning about pickup artists, but I didn't have anyone to help me generalize and apply what I was learning. So there was no gray area, it was all black and white. So I would end up nagging in a very negative way um, and telling her she was ugly, she didn't like that, that'll get you slapped occasionally. Um, and things like that. So literal thinking, I was telling her she was ugly. Black and white all or nothing thinking. Um, 
Friend zone. This is nice guys finish last. Let's talk about the friend zone. Um, when I was introduced to the friend zone, like I said again, I didn't have anyone helping me understand or navigate these sexual behavior issues. So I was left to do that on my own. And friend zone to me, um, when, a, when girls put you in a friend zone and say, well, we can only be friends, we can never date, they're, they're categorizing me and putting me, labeling me as a friend. Um, and if I ever wanted to date a girl, I started to develop this belief that you didn't want to be friends with a woman because it'll make them not want to date you. So friendship is unattractive and not being friends is attractive, basically. Um, and I didn't understand that, but that's how I was thinking. Um, and so now I know that that's actually completely the opposite because women do want to be friends with guys before they actually start dating them and form relationships with them. And, and this is a very important thing to remember. Um, and so... I just feel like I, I, I needed to, I misunderstood what friends on met. And I thought that I could never, ever be friends with a woman because she will never have a chance to romantically like me if I'm friends with her. So that's what the friends on meant to me. Um, and that's a very dangerous belief to develop because it, it, that's what led to me. That actually intensified my need to categorize people as either an acquaintance or a girlfriend from level step one. And that's what I think increased my Built my increased my behavior of going from step one to step seven hundred eighty seven because I knew that like I had to categorize if they were going to be a friend or a um, girlfriend from step one because I didn't want to fall into that friend zone if I liked them. Um, here we'll talk about the friend zone a little bit more. I was confused as an aspect of literal thinking. Pickup artist taught me about women's friend only zone. I thought I couldn't be friends with a woman or they would never like me romantically. Um, th- this exaggerated all my, my all or nothing thinking acquaintance to the girlfriend and step one and step 787, as I mentioned. Just kind of reviewing what I talked about. Peter F. Gerhardt. Um, pickup artists were making my situation worse. This is where I met the Sunbergs I talked about earlier. Um, and this is where I met Ben Seifert, who worked for the Sunbergs, BCBA Ben Seifert. Ben and the Sunbergs provided me pro bono ABA for a while. Ben was terrific. Like, I had a great time working with Ben. Um, we went out in the community, we went to Starbucks, we went to places and we talked to people and he, he was even going to help me with like messaging people and, um, you know, like how to talk to people. He was going to work with me on that. Um, but unfortunately I lived an hour and a half away, um, and couldn't make the commitment to therapy because I didn't have the money to drive back, gas money to drive back and forth from Fort Wayne, Indiana or Huntington, Indiana to, um, Fishers, Indiana, where Ben was at and Ben was working. I met Peter through the Sunbergs. Um, thus, my experience with ABA began. I was invited to hear Peter present in 2011 in Fishers at the Behavior Analysis Center for Autism. I listened to literally everything he said. I loved him because he was talking about my life. Peter, in that presentation, was describing every single thing that I had ever been through with autism. He knew autism inside and out, and he knew sexual behavior inside and out. Um, Context is king. Peter drove that into the ground and really drove that into my brain when I uh, heard him present there at the Behavior Analysis Center for Autism. And this is where he introduced me to the overall theme of this presentation, Can I Touch You? Step one is step 787. So Peter told the story about John. John's a made-up name that Peter likes to use when he presents. And Peter told the story about how John goes up to girls and says, Hi, my name is John. Can I touch your breast? Hi, my name is John. Can I touch your vagina? Hi, my name is John. Can I touch your feet? And so on. Um, why does he do that? Well, John had really good body part ID and really, really, really good body part ID because he knew every single body part on the female body. But John also knew and was taught that what do you have to do before you touch a woman? You need to ask her for permission to touch before you ask her. So step one is step 787, skipping steps two through 786. Um, I like Peter, I like John, like Peter talks about, can't even get a woman to say hi to me. Um, I'm desperate for help, and I'm struggling to interpret Peter's presentation. Um, for years, I struggled to interpret Peter's presentation. I didn't have a BCBA working with me. I had my 19-year-old DSP, and he didn't understand Peter's presentation at all and what Peter was talking about. Um, so here I was trying to generalize and apply what Peter said on my own. Um, the 19-year-old DSP wasn't P- PG. PG is what I will use to refer to Peter Gerhardt sometimes. Um, watching PG on YouTube, I watched him 
on his presentations. I watched him talk for about 50, 60 hours a week sitting at my computer on YouTube. I developed poor self-advocacy skills. I started advocating for myself. Um, I became excited to get help. I wanted to work with PG. I wanted social skills coaching. I wanted dating coaching. I wanted this thing called surrogate partner therapy. I wanted cuddle therapy. And I really wanted a girlfriend. Thousands of emails go out to the state. So I bet you I've literally sent 10,000 emails to people at the state of Indiana advocating for help with sexuality and sexual behavior. Um, I begged for help with sexuality and social skills. I drove people crazy and pushed people away, made people mad at me, uh, developed a mental illness because I was struggling to get what I needed. Um, that was where the anxiety and the depression started really kicking in. Um, and I started asking women for permission to touch them because of, I heard the, the, the example that Peter gave, even though Peter gave that as a bad example, step one and step 787, um, like I didn't have any replacement behaviors. So it was the only example I had to gravitate towards. Um, and I didn't know how to flirt before that. But unfortunately, asking a girl for permission to touch her is how I interpreted how you take how you begin the flirting process when I first heard Peter present that information. And so for about the next 10 years, I would spend my time flirting with girls online on Facebook by simply sending them messages, either asking them to send me pictures or asking them to let me touch them. And that was how I was flirting. And that's obviously not how you flirt. That's inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, asking someone for permission to touch them is the last step in the 787 step chain that goes from, hi, my name is Travis, to can I touch you? Um, so yeah, it's the last step. That's very important. Um, ask, like I said, uh, context is important, or consent, sorry. Consent is important. Um, it's important for me to get consent from a woman before I touch her. And I knew this, and I, I respect this, and I believe this, so I always ask for consent, always ask for permission, but it's inappropriate and disrespectful sexual behavior to ask for permission too soon with skipping steps. More about my inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, I struggled to interpret what Peter was explaining in presentations. Again, step one and step 787 is bad, but I need replacement behaviors. No one working with me at Peter's level I played a new video game on Facebook, so I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, I was on Facebook, right? And um, I actually, um, like to me, it became asking girls for permission to touch them, going from step one to step 787. Um, it became a video game for me. And what I mean by that is I was too shy to go out and do that in person. So I sat behind my computer screen on Facebook messaging women on Facebook and even some BCBAs, many BCBAs on Facebook and asked them for pictures or asked them for permission to touch. And it became like a video game for me. Um, I got a high off of it. Whenever I was able to mention sex or breast to a woman and talk about that, I would get a high off of it and I would masturbate and, you know, like, yes, I'm talking about masturbation. I would masturbate and I would get off and it became like a video game to me. And so... Um, like that's, you know, like it's, it's, it's so addictive to talk about sexual behavior sometimes, because if you think about being a 37 year old man with little experience with a woman and a high sex drive and imagine how that feels. Um, so I hid behind my computer screen and I generalized down to become lower functioning to qualify for services and work with my 19 year old DSP. This is the most important thing that you can probably take away from this presentation is that. I was asked to generalize and apply downward to become lower functioning and work on social skills at a lower level than what I was at in order to qualify for the state's Medicaid waiver to receive services. Um, and so basically I was told that social skills aren't important. You have Asperger's syndrome, that's not important. Um, so to put that in today's analogy, they would be like telling me, you have level one autism, your needs aren't important. You need to have level three autism for your needs to be important. Um, so in order to qualify for services from the state of Indiana, I would actually have to generalize down from level one autism to level three autism and become lower functioning. So I would have to go from needing social skills help to needing daily adaptive living skills help. Um, and that was really important to understand because I spent so much time generalizing down that it created a lot of identity issues. It, it was masking basically, masking my autism and becoming lower functioning. Um, 
creates identity issues, creates post-traumatic stress disorder, creates uh, split personality issues between level one and level three autism, um, and, and all of the above. So that's very important to know. Let's talk about Facebook a little bit. Um, I would ask women for pictures, like I said. I would talk to them sexually. I'd offer to pay them for sexual things. And this became learned behavior for me because it was how I was learning how to interact with women. I had nobody guiding me or mentoring me along the way. Um, girls taught me, some girls taught me to pay them for sexual favors. Um, so then I, I learned money got positive reinforcement from girls. Um, I set myself up by offering to pay the first me- in the first message sometimes. So like I uh, literally, because girls had socially conditioned me to believe that you had to pay them for sexual favors, I just started skipping steps and started, I believed that I had to do it, so I started offering money in the first message, and that would actually offend some girls because some girls weren't in it for money, and some girls are actually good girls and care about you and don't want to do things with you for money, um, which is really great and helpful. So, um, yeah, so basically I set myself up for failure. Now, obviously, when, some, when a woman tells you, you can touch me if I give you money, she's kind of exploiting you a little bit. But I was also exploiting myself because I was offering money first. Like I said, it was a learned behavior. Learned behavior is hard to change. Uh, skipping steps is not okay. I le- basically, I learned this. Skipping steps is not okay if you're not offering money. If you're doing it for free, women will think you're creepy. Um, skipping steps is okay with some women if you offer them money. So you can actually buy, you can buy your way out of the creep zone and become cool with money. Or at least the girl will pretend to think that you're cool if you give her money. Money made it easier to skip steps, which I really liked. And money made it easier for me to be who I was. So guys, let's talk about something important real quick and then we're going to take a break. Um, so yeah, I um, basically, I like the idea of a business transaction or relationship. Now, I don't like that as much as I like a real healthy relationship. But because healthy relationships are hard for me, and I think in rule-governed behavior, um, and I think about written rules, I love the idea of a sugar daddy type relationship because sugar daddy type relationships are very rule-defined and rule-governed. It is implied that if you give her this, she will give you that. And there's a set of rules involved in this relationship. Um, And so... This makes it easier for me to function. It creates less anxiety. Um, It creates, you know, just a more comfort level with the person I'm with because I'm not always guessing what they're thinking or feeling. And I'm not necessarily um, trying to read nonverbal communication or all the above. So I'm really just being able to relax and be myself. And the unfortunate thing is when you're Aspie and you're a little different they're a little creepy um you have to pay to be yourself long story short i developed the belief that you have to pay money to a girl to be yourself and be accepted for who you are when you have asperger syndrome um now i know looking back on this that that is completely 100 percent not true and i'm thankful for that and i'm learning about healthy relationships now and i'm just um really focused in on um, not offering people money to hang out with them because I think that that's inappropriate and disrespectful to the girl. Um, And if she's wanting money for a sexual favor, she's disrespecting herself. Um, And you don't want to be a part of that chain. Um, I don't want to be a part of disrespecting her because I actually really care about girls and want to get to know them for who they are and things like that. And so, but yeah, I just think it's very important to understand this, the reason why people with Asperger's syndrome might like a sugar daddy type relationship is that it's rule governed and our rules are defined in each of those transactional relationships. Um, you do this and I'll do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so we're going to take a little bit about a 20 minute intermission here. Um, I'll be, I'll be around to answer some questions and, um, I will, um, I'm going to grab a drink and answer some questions and then we'll be back to start back in on dive back into the important topics of behavior analysis, sexual behavior and life with autism spectrum disorder. All right. We'll see you guys in a few minutes.